let's talk about an important idea related to the idea of a Fourier series called a Fourier transform. So let's suppose we want to find a uh, Fourier series for some particular function. So let's let the function be e to the minus x squared in some region, let's say from negative pi to pi, and periodic outside of that region. So let's just make a quick plot of this, see what it looks like. So it peaks at zero and decays. And if we want periodic thereafter, then we have this function periodically extended outside of negative pi to pi. So we can write this function as a Fourier cosine expansion. So we write f of x as some constant plus a sum of cosine terms. Let's write out what all of these cosine terms actually are. Just look at a few of them. So we have a0, then we have the first one a1 cosine x, a2 cosine of 2x, and so on. So these represent certain discrete frequencies, namely omega equal to 0, omega equal to 1, omega equal to 2, and so on. So we're choosing certain discrete frequencies in our Fourier expansion. But what if we now want to extend the where this function is valid? So what if we want f of x not for negative pi to pi, but from negative 3 pi to positive 3 pi? So if we want our function in this region, and then, of course, periodic outside of that, let's take a quick sketch of what this looks like. So it looks like the function above, except we're not just stretching it. Now we're actually going out to a larger region. So we're going out to 3 pi and negative 3 pi from 0. So the function decays a lot more now and then uh, comes up a little bit on the regions outside because we want it periodically extended. So we would have a completely different series representation for f of x. It's still a constant plus a sum of cosine terms, but now inside the cosine terms we have nx over 3. Or writing this out, again, individual terms, so f of x is a0 plus a1 cosine of x over 3 plus a2 cosine of 2x over 3, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the frequencies that we're including here are omega equal to 0, omega equal to 1 third, omega equal to 2 thirds, omega equal to 3 thirds, or 1, and so on. So comparing it to the one we had above, it looks like we're including, including more frequencies. Um, and so that's indeed what's happening. So as we extend the region in which we write our Fourier series, we include more frequencies, or to be a bit more precise, we're including a denser amount of frequencies. The density of the frequencies that we're using uh, increases, because of course there's an infinite number of frequencies in both cases. Okay, so this is a really important point that it's worth stating uh, again, just in a slightly revised way. So as you expand the range uh, over which you want a Fourier series to be valid, you increase the number, or rather the density, of the frequencies that you need to include in your Fourier series. So this leads to an interesting thought experiment. What happens if we took our function f of x e to the minus x squared from negative l to l and periodic outside of that region? And what if we then let l go to infinity? Well, it seems like we should be about able to do this. And if you were able to do this, this would give f of x for all x. Kind of a neat little trick. Can you do this? Of course you can. You absolutely can write a Fourier series for this function over l go to infinity and periodic thereafter. The only trick is you need to include not discrete frequencies, but you need to include all continuous frequencies in order to do this. Otherwise, it's not possible. So what we do is we call this the Fourier cosine transform. OK, and so the Fourier cosine transform, uh, we take a function f of x and rewrite it as, well, there's a the square root of 2 over pi. There's an integral f hat c of w cosine of wx dw. Let's talk about these terms. So the root 2 over pi is just a convention. It's an annoying convention. You have to have it there. 
The sum becomes an integral. Previously we had a Fourier series, now we have a Fourier integral. F hat C of W, this is kind of like the A sub N in the Fourier series. These are telling you the amplitudes of the individual frequencies. And we went from N to W, so W is kind of like the N, except it's really now just the frequency. N previously were discrete numbers, here W is really the frequency. In terms of notation, we call this f hat c of w, we call this the Fourier cosine transform. That's what we mean by, or that's what we call it, that's what we mean by it. This is closely related to uh, something called the Fourier integral, um, which doesn't have the square root of 2 over pi factor, uh, and so we can pretty much use them essentially interchangeably. They're really closely related. Let's talk a little bit about what this Fourier cosine transform even means. So let's look at a particular function, f of x, that we've seen before. So let's just do cosine of x. Okay. So f of x being cosine of x, what should the Fourier transform of this be? So the Fourier transform will just be a spike at w equal to positive 1. So the Fourier transform is just telling you that there's only one frequency in your original function, and this frequency is at w equal to 1. So let's go the other way. What if for my Fourier transform I have a spike not only at 1, but also at w equal to 16? So a large spike at w equal to 1, and a smaller spike at w equal to 16. So this is telling me that I now have two frequencies in my function. And one of them is at w equal to 1. And then there's another one with a smaller amplitude at w equal to 16. OK, so f of x goes something like cosine of x plus cosine of 16x, where there's a smaller amplitude on the cosine of 16x. So let me just sketch out what that should look like. So it should look like uh, cosine of x with wiggles on top. So it lo should look roughly like this. That's what the Fourier transform uh, of this particular function should look like. OK, so this f hat c of w, the Fourier cosine transform, is telling you the amplitudes of the frequencies, the cosine frequencies, that make up f of x. Okay. So now that we know kind of what f hat c of w is, or what the Fourier cosine transform is, how do we compute this thing? Well, of course, there's some expression involving another integral. So there's a square root of 2 over pi, integral 0 to infinity, the function f of x, cosine of w times x dx. It kind of looks like the integrals we used when we did Fourier series. So as an example, let's compute the cosine Fourier transform. of the function we've been talking about, e to the minus x squared. So we insert e to the minus x squared in our expression for the Fourier cosine transform above. And then we look at this integral, and we go, ooh, um, that's not a pretty integral. That's kind of tough to do by hand. So let's call up Mathematica and do this on a computer. So there's a Fourier cosine transform we write e to the minus x squared with respect to x, and we want it to be in terms of w, and it spits out a Fourier cosine transform. Okay, and so converting this to our conventions, this becomes 1 half e to the minus w squared over 4. And so what this looks like for f of x as a function of x, well, it's a Gaussian. f of x is a Gaussian. That's what we mean by something that looks like e to the minus x squared. And its transform is also a Gaussian, e to the minus w squared over 4. OK. So in this case, this is actually a very special case when the Fourier transform looks like the original function. In general, of course, that doesn't always happen. Um, but a Gaussian turns out to be transformed into a Gaussian. OK. In practice, it's quite difficult to compute these Fourier transforms by hand. It's just not something that's particularly useful to do. And so you usually use a, a table of Fourier transforms or a computer.